Welcome to Leo's Everyday Tech. You're in the middle of a task, backing up your iPhone or editing a video, when suddenly, ding, a notification pops up. Your disk is almost full. You delete some files, thinking you've bought yourself time. But a few days later, the problem is back. Has this ever happened to you? I wondered if there was a permanent solution. Sure, I could splurge on a new MacBook with more SSD storage. But when I saw that Apple charges an extra $600 just to upgrade from 512 gigabytes to 2 terabytes, I hesitated. Even if I could afford it, was that really the smartest way to spend my hard-earned money? Determined to find a better way, I began exploring alternatives to expand my MacBook storage without breaking the bank. And today, I want to share how I did just that, at a fraction of the cost. First, let's explore existing storage expansion options. If your laptop has an SD card slot, can you use an SD card to extend your MacBook storage? This idea isn't new. Transcend offers the JetDrive series SD cards, designed specifically for MacBooks. A one terabyte card costs $140 and sits flush when inserted. Another option is BasicKey's microSD adapter for $35. Could this be the simple solution I was looking for? But is it worth it? Personally, I wouldn't choose this route, and here's why. I tried copying a 97 gigabyte file to an SD card, and it took a staggering 33 minutes. Can you imagine waiting that long every time? Their speeds are woefully inadequate for daily work, so they're off the table. I need something faster and more reliable. It seems that the best solution is an external SSD connected via the Thunderbolt port. Even entry-level MacBook Airs support up to 40 gigabits per second transfer speeds through USB 4 or Thunderbolt. The possibilities were exciting, but then came another question. Which external SSD should I choose? 10 gigabits per second, 20 gigabits per second, or 40 gigabits per second? If 10 gigabits per second is good enough, wouldn't 40 gigabits per second be four times better? It seemed logical, but in reality, the performance boost in daily tasks wasn't as significant as I thought. It's like driving a high-performance sports car in city traffic. You won't get to experience its full potential. Plus, many 40 gigabits per second SSDs tend to overheat, are unstable, or just too bulky. After weighing my options, I settled on the SanDisk Extreme Pro 4 terabytes. Why? Well, I found a fantastic deal for $199 in Amazon's resale section. But it wasn't just about the price. The SanDisk ticked all the boxes. It's fast, slim, and reliable. Perfect for my needs. Now, I face the challenge of integrating this external SSD seamlessly with my MacBook. Here's how I did it. Gathered the essentials. A short Type-C data cable, about 10 centimeters long a U-shaped USB-C adapter, one in male, the other female, double-sided tape to secure the SSD to the back of the MacBook, a slim laptop stand to elevate the MacBook slightly. Mounting the SSD, I attached the SSD to the back of the MacBook using the double-sided tape, connected it using the short cable and U-shaped adapter to keep everything tidy. The laptop stand not only improved airflow and typing comfort, but also concealed the slight bulk of the SSD. After testing it for a few weeks, I found that in daily use, like slipping the MacBook into a bag, you hardly notice it's there. You might be thinking, isn't this just sticking a drive to the back of the MacBook? What's the big deal? Well, this setup transformed my MacBook into a complete system, a whole package, if you will. Let me explain. Think of an aircraft carrier. Alone, it's powerful, but vulnerable. But when it's part of a carrier battle group with escort ships and aircraft, it becomes a dominant force. Similarly, a MacBook with a layered storage architecture becomes a powerhouse. The ideal storage architecture should have three layers, RAM, SSD, including optional external SSD, and NAS. The upper layers are smaller but faster, and each layer works in harmony with the ones adjacent to it. For example, for Macs with Apple Silicon chips, when physical memory, RAM, becomes insufficient, the system offloads inactive data to the SSD, freeing up space in the physical memory for active processes. 
This process is referred to as memory swapping. When the internal SSD becomes insufficient, we want to offload the infrequently used large files or folders to an external SSD, so the internal SSD always has ample free space. So, how do we achieve this? That's the crux of our discussion. Letting the external SSD automatically alleviate storage pressure from the internal SSD. I will discuss the details later. However, our system isn't truly complete yet because there's still a vulnerability. If the internal SSD fails, the system won't boot. If the external SSD fails, all its data is gone. So, we need a final storage layer, a NAS, Network Attached Storage. Typically, a NAS offers much more storage than the combined capacity of the internal and external SSDs. By configuring Time Machine, we can set both internal and external drives as backup targets. This process happens silently in the background, requiring no manual intervention and ensuring absolute data security. With that being said, to unlock your MacBook's full potential, we prefer a layered storage architecture rather than a single ample internal storage. Following this logic, instead of spending $600 just to upgrade from 512 gigabytes to two terabytes, I would spend $200 on an external SSD and the remaining $400 on an NAS. Do you agree that allocating money to build a complete system will give you a more robust and reliable setup in the long run? Finally, let's revisit the problem of offloading space from the internal SSD to the external SSD. To accomplish this, we can move folders that continuously grow based on personal usage patterns to the external drive. Since the external drive has ample space, like my four terabyte SSD, running out of space is nearly impossible. Which folders continuously grow? And how do we settle them on the external drive? Typically on macOS, folders that keep expanding include the Photos Library, Music Library, Movies Folder, or backups of iOS devices. How do we move them? Simply relocating these folders isn't enough because the system's default storage paths remain on the internal drive. Next time, it'll pile data back onto the internal SSD, and you'll be back to manual cleanups, defeating the purpose. Therefore, this move needs to be permanent. There are usually two methods. Change the default storage location in applications. For the photos library, you can move it to the external drive, then delete the original. The next time you open photos, specify the new path. Use symbolic links. For other folders, a more universal method is to use symbolic links. Take the system's default downloads folder as an example. The steps are, move the downloads directory to the external drive. Create a symbolic link so the system and applications believe the folder is still in its original location. But the files are actually stored on the external drive, ensuring everything functions normally. Currently, my downloads folder is a symbolic link, and opening it shows that its actual path is on the external SSD. If you're unfamiliar with creating symbolic links or encounter errors, feel free to comment, and I can make a dedicated video to explain in detail. With these three layers and their automated coordination, our MacBook system can truly be called a complete system. What do you think of my perspective? Admittedly, hiding a drive behind the laptop is just a small trick, and SanDisk isn't the only option. Following my approach, the Crucial X10 Pro and Samsung T7 Portable SSD are also good choices. Oracle's magnetic designs might be even thinner and are worth a try. The key point is that only by transforming your MacBook into a complete system can you unlock its full potential. Thank you for watching. If this video helped you, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe for more tech tips and tricks. See you in the next one.